as I sit now and I think about how amazing it is to be CEO of Girls Who Code, one of the largest girls organizations on the planet, and to be able to do this work every day on behalf of a community that I deeply believe in and understand and you know, remind me so much of the challenges that I was facing when I was younger. You know, there's so much that goes into, I think, the fabric of what got me to where I am now. You know, I think everyone knows this because I say it all the time. You know, I'm Jamaican American. I was born and raised between, you know, Brooklyn, New York and Kingston, Jamaica. And that's so cool. It's very Mm -hmm. cool. And I did. By the way, can you pull out? Can you pull out a great Jamaican accent whenever you want to? Without question. It's Can we the hear a switching. little? <laughs> <Can> we... <laughs> I don't mean to your... other you. I'm just celebrating it. It's the best accent ever. Listen to Faith. Nobody oh. tests me right now. <laughs> wow. <laughs> it's very, it's oh, very easy to conjure because that's what happens. For me, I was born and raised in New York and had, you know, a rich Jamaican culture that enveloped me, especially, you know, being in Brooklyn. And you can think about it, West Indian Day parades, all the things but what was unique is that I then went to Jamaica for high school which doesn't happen usually it's usually you're born in Jamaica and then come to the U.S. I was the reverse so it was culture shock Um, but definitely a wonderful experience growing up in a third world country completely different culture and experience and you know I'm blessed to say that I stand on the shoulders of just generations of inspiration I can fondly remember you know gosh my mom from our early days and my grandmother, they were like serial entrepreneurs before I even knew what an entrepreneur was. They had such a sense, and you said power faith, but they felt that if they could think it, they could do it. And the reason that this matters and is powerful, my grandmother actually dropped out of school in the sixth grade back in Jamaica after her mother died to help, you know, work on the family farm and raise her Mm. seven younger siblings. And You can't imagine that a woman who came from that experience where her own education had been cut short could somehow still manage to instill in her four children the notion that education would be the future, that it could pry open, you know, every door, every opportunity. And, you know, that and her granddaughter of... has a PhD and is a CEO <laughs> and has just so many acronyms Listen, and initials. you are so kind, Faith. And I mean, honestly, I don't think she could have fathomed that in, in yeah. just a number of generations. But that is what, you know, fuels me and makes me realize that the kind of change we want to see for our young people it's not even a generation away. I have stories of young people in our programs for whom this is the case too. And, you know, you ask about my origin story. You know, I come to tech, you know, a really different way. I come to this space as an educator and an activist, and I've always been passionate about issues of equity in education. And I mentioned that my mom She's been an inspiration. She taught me not just the power of education, but also to go into spaces, right? To see the kind of work that was necessary but wasn't getting done. And to have the agency to believe that I could actually be the change that's needed. And, you know, when I had a chance to work at the New York City Department of Education, where I gave you that anecdote of not being called doctor, you know, I got a chance to actually put these lessons into practice. And It was a blessing of all blessings. I got a chance to work with kids who, frankly, many people were no longer interested in. Many of them were poor black and brown kids who looked a lot like me when I was their age, but who were also significantly off track academically with no shot of graduating on time. And I had a chance to- What did you tell them? When when you would meet a kid like that and could identify that, that other people had sort of dismissed them, what would you say? Gosh, these kids were wonderful. I don't think, you know, I also, because of the kinds of programs that we created for them, I believe that they also stepped into their own agency. Most of the time, Faith, they were inspiring me. You know, when I would go to graduations at some of these transfer schools that would support kids who were really off track academically through trimesters and all kinds of interventions, I'd be crying like a baby because their stories were so powerful. And I would be very quick to share my own in terms of where I was coming from because so much of what we say at Girls Who Code is that you can't be what you can't see. So I know when I stand, you know, in, you know, the role I have today with a PhD, with the title CEO, and with, you know, any accolade that folks are kind enough to give me, 
I remind our young people that this is but a step away for you. You are ready. The dream is right there. You're living it. And frankly, because of my deep faith in education, like I've always, you know, said, don't squander it. You have this opportunity. Use it. And when I had a chance to be at the DOE, I actually led the team that designed and launched the first high school ever in New York City focused on software engineering. And that I knew could be a game changer. But the thing that was really interesting about that opportunity was that as the school was originally envisioned, it wasn't really going to be open to every kid. It was going to be a quote unquote screen school, which would mean that kids would have to test in. And this was an inflection point for me leading this project. I knew that if we were gonna rely on test scores, that our kids of color would be at a disadvantage that would be insurmountable, Mm -hmm. right? We know why. Poverty, disinvestment in low income neighborhoods, we know racial bias is real. And so, my journey in that moment was all about fighting against this notion of screening and rallying support to open the school to any student interested in programming, even if it risks turning off some of our key stakeholders, this mashup of venture capitalists and local tech entrepreneurs. And how did you convince, how did, I presume you won that battle? It, it I did. An uns- how? Like, did. were you, so, were you uh, in the movie that I'm writing? <laughs> and by the way, I'm casting you in it. You're in a room, probably in front of a lot of white people. Yes. And you have this chance to make this big speech. Like, what did you say? Yeah, I would say that in the movie, it's one speech, but in real life, <laughs> it's multiple, right? And I remember we were together in a room, and I kid you not, another colleague of mine said to the room of folks who were all about starting this school, right? Before we landed on the kind of school it was going to become. This is just when it was all pie in the sky. And the colleague said, how many of you have a child in the New York City public school system? And that room of oh, white boy. you know, men in tech, not one hand went up. So it's a reminder that that was one kind of conversation. And sometimes it was about finding validators, right? Folks who were leading incredible schools throughout the city, principals who were changing lives, who were teaching black and brown kids <laughs> and reminding this room like, hey, mm-hmm. it doesn't have to resemble this elite school over here because that was the model. They wanted it to look like Stuyvesant High School. And, you know, to the credit of the DOE, we said no. We were like, we're not going to replicate another one of these inequitable situations. So a lot of it was finding validators. A lot of it was presenting data. And a lot of it was having hard questions and challenging, frankly, racist assumptions, right? And again, it I can say I'm so proud that many of the folks who were clear that this was the right way to go, who were hesitant to create this school, are now believers and spokespeople and champions for issues of equity. So sometimes when you do this work, it goes further than you even imagine. And getting that school off the ground, for me, was one of my proudest accomplishments as an educator. But it was also, Greg and Faith, an important lesson, right? That as humans, as hard as this is, We have to be able to exist always at the intersection of opportunity and bravery, right? Because if we're given the chance to disrupt the status quo, we have to seize it. And, you know, when I think about that experience, it was almost kind of almost like a blueprint or an early bit of exposure that led me to this moment here at Girls Who Code, where I'm now the CEO driving this work forward in an even bigger way. I love that you use the word uh, bravery. I know it's part of uh, part of part of the values that um, Girls Who Code. It's part of your your uh, value statement, and you know, there's a part of it that I, I I really love that you touched on, and it's the notion of persistence. And in doing this work, I can't think of anything more important than having the persistence, because this work is. Um, you know, it, it, it's it's every day and you've got to have incredible stamina um, and ambition, all the things that I know you stand for. And it strikes me, um, Tarika, just how there's so many similarities between, I think, the tech industry and the financial services industry. And I, I talk a lot on um, on this podcast, Faith and I have spent a lot of time talking about you know, truth and reconciliation for the financial services industry. And um, I like to say that I think truth and reconciliation are actually sequential. 
-hmm. And what I mean by that is our industry had to go through the, its own reckoning of how we've contributed, how the industry has contributed to so many of the disparities that um, that we're all working so hard to to fix. Um, how do you think, and, and what changes do you think are necessary within the tech industry? And you know, how do you think about this, the the industry itself going through this whole truth and reconciliation about where we've come from and are things getting better? I think, you know, in, in many cases, I've seen statistics that say we're getting worse. Um, how do you think the industry is responding to some of these challenges? And, and before you answer, Tariq, I just want to yeah. jump in with this very illuminating uh, uh, statistic to Greg's point. In 1995, 37% of computer scientists were women. Today, it's only 24%. That's right. Wow. Um, you're both uh, not wrong. And Greg, your question is such a good <laughs> one. And how tech is responding. And, you know, to be honest, the other thing, too, has frankly been the layering on of the pandemic as well as mm -hmm. the movement around racial, you know, reckoning. And those have both led to, I think, more introspection on the part of tech. But I would say that the struggles that we've already been talking about remain true. Like those numbers, Faith, are abysmal. We can't believe that we're still going backwards. Like, you know. Why? Why? So yeah. there are a couple of Why? reasons for it. I would say um, when you think about it, women are making gains in almost every other STEM area. The, you know, all the other STEM areas except for computer science. That's where we're actually going backward. And I think it's twofold. It's definitely this culture and representation piece. We say it all the time that you can't be what you can't see because, you know, frankly, our girls, gosh, before they even, you know, are 10 years old, double digits, they are inundated with these images of what a computer scientist looks like and does. And these are notions that resonate with them their entire lives. So we're talking elementary school, middle school, high school, and beyond. And, you know, if you think about who we're taught about even, like even today, it's still the Mark Zuckerbergs, right? It's still Steve Jobs. It's still Elon Bill Musk. Gates, right? Uh -huh. Elon Musk, right? Uh -huh. <laughs> right, right now. They're not hearing about... Katherine Johnson or Mary Jackson, who you'll recall from the movie Hidden Figures. Hedy or, Lamar. Right. Jean Bartik, Ada Lovelace, Grace Hopper. They're still, the culture piece is very real, right? And that's why we're so, you know, we have a laser-like focus on teaching girls computer science and building this incredible pipeline that we now have that's 500,000, you know, girls and non-binary students strong.